Welcome to Casual Friday. Today I'm going to talk about how the internet has enhanced our collective knitting intelligence while simultaneously creating some homogeneous thinking. First, I'm going to update you on what's been going on in my knitting life for the past week. So if you'd like to jump right to today's topic, you'll find links down in the description. So next week, April 27th to 29th, the Minnesota Knitters Guild's annual yarn over event is happening here in the Twin Cities. And I'll be teaching two classes at yarn over. I'm teaching a class on mock cables and I'm also teaching a class on knitting refinements, which is really sort of uh, finishing techniques that aren't uh, used when the knitting is finished. It's the stuff that goes on before you knit and while you're knitting that helps you to create uh, the best finished result in your project. So there are a few spots still left in each of those classes, and I believe you can still register. If you can't register online, I think they still have walk-in registrations on the day of the event, which will be Saturday. There, there are events going on on Friday and the monthly Minnesota Knitters Guild meeting, which is open to anyone, is on Sunday. Sally Melville will be, teach, will be pro, uh, doing the program for that. And the guild meeting will be at the same location where the, the rest of Yarn Over will be going on. And even if you don't want to take classes, they have a fantastic marketplace that goes on during Yarn Over that's open all day Saturday. So if you're in the Twin Cities or planning on being in the Twin Cities next weekend, you might want to check that out. The second thing that I want to share with you, my friend Ron at the dog park, he's the guy who brought me some yarn back from Ireland. I made some photographer's gloves for him last year. He uh, ran up to me at the dog park the other day and said, oh, I have something in my car my, my wife wants you to have. And uh, she's a knitter, but I think she's sort of an on-again, off-again knitter. But her sister, who lives in Massachusetts, had given her four hanks of this yarn, and she she found it itchy like she 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 didn't like the way it felt and she didn't couldn't didn't want to use it and so she thought maybe i would want to use it and uh, what it is it's four hanks of it and it's a worsted weight yarn it's a natural color wool sort of um a light brown and it's from the nantic community organic farm and apparently this yarn was spun in Harmony, Maine using the Bartlett spinning mule, the last operating mule in the US. So I didn't know what a spinning mule was, but I had heard of Bartlett yarns before. So I, uh, I went online just to, to see if I could figure out what it was. I found a little video that showed it. And from what I gather, I'm not a spinner and I don't know anything really about mills, um, but from what I gather, the the spinning mule aims to simulate the movements of a hand spinner in the way it draws the, the fibers out. And it does this, it has like a ton of spindles. And so it's spinning a bunch of them at one time, but it, it has them all on this rack that kind of moves forward and backwards um, as it's spinning the yarn. And I don't know if that was the standard method of spinning yarn a hundred years ago when this uh, mule was first put into place or if it was uh, a different method. I, I don't really know much about the history of spinning mules, but apparently it's not a technique or a piece of machinery that's used nowadays. Um, so that's interesting. And I don't know if they do tours, if you're out in Maine or something, if, if, if you can do tours of Bartling yarns, I think that would be something I would be interested in doing someday. So, so it doesn't say, I looked on their website, couldn't find anything about what kind of sheep this came from. So I've been collecting different sheep breed yarns lately with this idea that I was going to be doing swatching and comparing them and learning something about different breeds. Uh, I don't know what breed this is, but, and I'm like, I have four hanks of it. What am I going to knit? And it's not something I'd want up against my neck. It's a rustic yarn. It's not enough to make a sweater. And I've been buying these single skeins of different wools thinking, well, that's my project is just, you know, a swatch with this breed so that I can learn more about it and, and in the future would know um, when to use it if I wanted to make a project that would be suitable for it. So all of the yarns I've gotten so far are worsted weight. 
And so what I'm thinking is coming up with some sort of standard square that I can knit, because they're all worsted weight, that I can knit with these yarns in order to test them. It will test with texture and we'll test with cables and things like that. And so my thought is then that I can combine all of these into some sort of blanket over time. It would just be a long-term project where I'd knit a square and attach it uh, or knit a strip and attach it in some way. Um, I haven't come up quite yet with what exactly I want to do and I want it to be something that will be interesting to me and something that I can uh, make the same size every time without having to uh, swatch and re-swatch in order to, to make that work. But that's my idea is that I will actually turn these these different wools into a blanket and I, I'm trying to figure out a way to to indicate in the square what the wool is so that I have a memory of it and instead of you know some point in the future well here's a blanket a bunch of different wools I don't know which is which I want to be able to remember so either knitting in um, BFL for Blue Face Luster or what is this NCO for Nantech Community Organic Farm something like that something that will help me remember uh, what where I got these wools and, and what breeds they are if I know the breed. So last week's Casual Friday video on multicolor knitting really um, struck a nerve with people. Uh, I, I got a lot of comments uh, asking me if I had seen Arnie and Carlos's videos on color dominance and because Arnie and Carlos apparently say that there is no color dominance in Norwegian knitting. Well, I'd seen some of their videos before, but not any of these specific ones that people were talking about. So I did spend some time last weekend looking at several of their videos where they talk about Norwegian knitting and where they're talking about color dominance and, and how they handle the yarns and what is considered good technique within the, within the context of Norwegian knitting. So I think it's important to understand the context in which uh, they're talking about color dominance. They're talking about their experience in the tradition that they um, live in, which is Norwegian knitting, which has certain specifications or certain desired outcomes and certain types of motifs and uses of color that are different from other techniques that also employ stranded color work. To them, color dominance, which I would actually refer to as yarn dominance, to them it's, it appears to be a, a tension issue and they work to show you how you can uh, knit comfortably and in a style that will work for you and achieve really good tension with Norwegian knitting. And one of the things that they talk about is that this idea of parallel floats is not something that uh, that that they at least have experienced in Norwegian knitting and that it's not important that you can twist the yarns and they they show different ways of which the yarns get too twi twisted how you can work by twisting them in the opposite direction for a while so really what they're talking about is using uh, rotating floats and that was what that was the the revelation that I had had last week was that rotating floats is uh, something that some traditions do use and that it does not create yarn dominance. While poor tension can create problems uh, in your stitch sizes, uh, yarn dominance in ferrile knitting is not a, a, a product of poor tension. It's a product of parallel floats. So last week I was showing you uh, this swatch right here where you could see that the, the red yarn was dominant, then there was uh, balanced floats here and then the gray was dominant here and what I had done here was I had worked in parallel floats where the red is dominant and the gray is dominant and I had I had worked with one yarn in each hand uh, and the left yarn was the one that was holding the dominant color now my husband was talking to me later and saying well you haven't really proved your point that um, parallel floats cause dominance because you held the dominant yarn in your left hand both times and if you have looser tension that that's you know just proving their point and um, I said no no and they're parallel I'll prove it I'll prove that the parallel floats are the, are the cause so I knit another swatch right here and in this one I used green and blue and in each case the green is dominant and the blue is not 
On the bottom swatch, I knit with one yarn in each hand. In the middle swatch, I knit with uh, both yarns in my left hand, and then the top one, I knit with both yarns in my right hand. So when the yarns were both held in my left hand, both yarns were over the same index finger, and I just made sure that when I worked the green yarn, I was always, it was always coming from below, and the blue yarn was always from above. And then when I held both yarns in my right hand, I always made sure, again, that the blue yarn was being carried above and the green yarn was, was below. And it's, it's that parallel nature that causes the yarn dominance. Now, Arnie and Carlos were very careful to say in the comments within their videos when people were questioning about this, that they were not making any comments about other knitting traditions because what they are familiar with and what their tradition is, is Norwegian knitting. So they're talking about what is true within the context of their knitting tradition. And what I was um, talking about last week was that this idea that the parallel floats is the way to work it, that the English language uh, books and a lot of the teaching is this idea of parallel floats is what you want. And, and what, recognizing that when you have parallel floats, you get yarn dominance. And so Arnie and Carlos are like, oh, do you don't want to have to worry about that. You just work them, work them however, and then if there's no dominance, then you don't have to worry about it. And they're right within the context of Norwegian knitting. So I just want to show you, this is a book from, uh, this is a book called Traditional Fair Isle Knitting. So here, here are some charts from this book. So the charts are made up of just black dots um, in white squares. So that's the pattern that you would work with. Within Fair Isle Knitting, you're only working with two colors in any row, just like with Norwegian Knitting. With Norwegian Knitting, overwhelmingly, the patterns are either a white background with some kind of dark color pattern on top of it, or a dark background with a white or light colored um, pattern on it. So not only are you only working with two colors in any given round, in most cases, you're only working with two colors for the entire project. So following a, uh, a design that is black dots on white squares uh, is going to be obvious. You're not going to have any trouble keeping track of which yarn you're using to create that pattern regardless of whether it's above or below, you're twisting it or whatever. There's no, there's no issue with that. Fair Isle Knitting has a different tradition and that is, and here's an example, I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but you'll see that the background color and the foreground colors are changing within the course of the entire motif. So that's when, and if you're following a pattern that's black dots on a white background, you need to be able to keep track of which one is creating the pattern and which one is the background. So, and then the, and, and the other aspect of fair isle knitting is that you never have more than five consecutive stitches in the same color. So you don't have any need to trap floats ever. So within that context, that narrow subset of stranded color work, um, which is fair isle, true fair isle knitting, parallel floats make an incredible amount of sense because you can always, you always know that your upper yarn, whether you have yarn in, in one in each hand or both yarns in the same hand. The upper yarn is always the background and the lower ground is always the foreground. And you know that the foreground is going to have dom dominance. That's why, that's why you organize them in that way because you want the pattern to show up. So within that, the context of feral knitting, it makes a lot of sense to use parallel floats to recognize that there's yarn dominance and use that in your favor. So there are, two, there are two different traditions that have different goals and different uh, expected outcomes. In Norwegian knitting, you do need to trap floats because there, there can be uh, incredibly long spans of time when you're only working in one color and not the other. So you need a way to trap the floats and their method tends to be to twist the yarn around, which is another sort of like a double rotation of yarn. So those two different knitting traditions have different reasons for using the, the techniques that they use, and they have different expectations for, what the out, for the outcome that they want to achieve. So the problem is 
that we have uh, as a knitting community, in, at least in the English language, have overgeneralized how we teach stranded collar work by, by teaching the method that's used in ferrule knitting and neglecting uh, to recognize that there is a reason why this technique is used in this knitting. And also to they've over we've overgeneralized the term fair isle knitting to often encompass all stranded knitting, and that is not the case. So I think it's important to understand that there's two different traditions that have two different goals. And then when you throw in that Latvian uh, knitting tradition, which can throw five, six colors in one round, <laughs> then you start to realize, okay, they have to have, you know. Different traditions need different methods of managing the yarn, and none of them is is necessarily the best way to work overall. You cannot you cannot generalize that this one method of working a strand of color work is the right method in all cases because it's not. So I've been thinking about this this I, this ideal of generalization, and I think it's something that humans do. I think it's probably a survival trait where you you use you know your the your your previous experiences to inform you about what you are going to do in this experience and the fewer experiences that you have the more you're apt to overgeneralize but what's happened in with um, knitting the, the knitting community in the past i don't know 15 years or so as they've really come onto the internet and we've shared our expertise and we've learned different techniques is that we often assume that oh here's another way of getting to the same end point and I like this way a lot better so I'm going to take that technique and then I'm just going to I'm going to cut it and then paste it into uh, the project that I was working on that called for this other technique sometimes that works just fine and sometimes it doesn't sometimes you need to make an adjustment in order to accommodate a different technique that will get you to the same end point. So a, a really easy way of understanding this is if you have ever worked increases in a pattern, you know that a make one increase occurs between two stitches while a knit front back uh, is created in the process of knitting a stitch. So you can't just say, you can't just take the instructions that call for using a knit front back and then just replace them, make one without making an adjustment to how many stitches you worked prior to working an increase. I did a video on, on this uh, a few weeks back that I'll link to up at the top. And I, you know, I've seen this with uh, different short row techniques as well, like German short rows. People really like German short rows and they, when they're trying to make a substitution, they often mistake uh, the importance of the flag, the thing that signals where your previous turn was. They, they think you're so supposed to substitute one flag for the other rather than maintaining the same turning point. And different techniques place the flag in different locations, so that can cause confusion. And the number of stitches that you work before you turn versus um, the number of stitches you work past a previous turn before you turn again, all of that needs to be adjusted. It isn't just a, oh, I'll take that technique and, and use it in this other place. So that's another place that we tend to overgeneralize. But a lot of times we're just not aware of, of all of the possibilities. We'll notice that, oh, this technique works really well for me. I'm going to tell everybody they should use this technique without recognizing that the reason the technique works so well for you is because of the way you handle the yarn and needles. I fell in love with cables early on as a knitter. And in the first 20 years or so that I was a knitter, I was a thrower. And most of the patterns that I knit were flat and then seamed. I mostly knit sweaters. And uh, the way I knit was I had very long needles, like I had, you know, these 14 inch long needles like this, and I would anchor it at the junction of my hip and thigh so it was pointing straight up. And then I would hold the other needle in this hand. Um, let me know if I can show you what I mean. Let's see. I can you even see this? So, so if I have the, the needle right here, I'm not holding on to it, I'm touching it. The other work would be hanging from here and I would just 
hold the needle. I wouldn't hold it in my hand. I would just touch it, but I would mount the stitches onto my right hand needle. I would knit with, you know, I'd throw the yarn. And so I was, it was kind of like a sewing machine in a way. It was like going up and down like this. So when I was using a cable needle, I preferred a four inch straight metal slick needle and I would slip the stitches on there and I would, I would hold the cable needle. I, I keep a finger between the regular needle and the cable needle. So they're being held in parallel. And then I would just knit off whichever needle I needed to knit off. So the only disruption in how quickly I was knitting was in just getting those stitches onto the cable needle. It was, it was just not that much slower than just a regular row of knitting. So I always found that very, um, very easy to knit. So when people, when I started hearing people talk about knitting without a cable needle, I didn't understand, you know, I, I, tr I, I didn't understand why they would want to do that because I didn't, I didn't find it particularly slow to, to use a cable needle. And then I decided, oh, it's, then I started hearing people talk about putting the stitches on the needle and then letting it go and letting it hang. And I'm like, why would you do that? And, you know, so they were using either the U hooks or the J hooks or the bird wing ones and they would let it hang and then they would knit and then they would um, pull it back up. So I, I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's, that's what's slowing them down. I started wanting, I wanted to knit socks. I wanted to do more knitting in the round. And the problem with that was that my knitting style relied on long needles that were anchored. So in order for me to use a circular needle or double pointed needles, I had to hold way down. I had to, to hold the knitting way down near my hips. And if it was a double pointed needle, it was pointed into my, it hurt. So I thought, well, this isn't, this isn't working for me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to learn how to do the continental knit stitch so that I can knit socks. And I did learn that and it, it took a while to learn that but it was not my favorite way of knitting i only used it for sock knitting and when i had to do knits and pearls i i did it anchored down in in my hip area and i spent four years looking for a purling method that would uh, match my knitting method it just took me forever i've really struggled with the kind of pearl now i have no problem with it and i, I found a method that works for me um but the first time I wanted to do cables while I was knitting Continental, I suddenly understood the appeal of cabling without a cable needle. Um, the problem was that I had the cable needle uh, and the yarn all in one hand, like everything was in one hand. I was knitting off the yarn in this hand, the cable needle was in my left hand and my regular needle was in my left hand my right hand had very little to do. And it was just, and if I was knitting traveling cables that were cables that had knits and pearls, moving the yarn in front or behind one, it was, I was like, okay, I, I get it now. I get why somebody would want to cable without a cable needle. Um, but I didn't get it before because the, the, my specific knitting situation made using a cable needle very easy. So I think, I think when you're, when your experience is limited and you don't realize how your experience is limiting you, it's very easy to overgeneralize the usefulness of a particular technique or the non-usefulness of a particular technique. Um, you know, a technique may be, have disadvantages in your specific situation, but it may have a great a number of advantages in a different situation or for a different knitter. So, you know, I think it's it's so great how the internet brings knitters together and they can help solve people's knitting problems by offering various solutions. But what's what is really interesting to me is how a particular thought or opinion or technique or whatever begins to dominate and become known as the true one way of doing something um and and a lot of people just accept it like i there was something that that i uh, learned when i first was on the internet with knitters and i was just beginning i think it was 
just about the time I was beginning the master hand netting program. I had never washed or blocked any, I'd never, I'd probably washed something. I'd never like blocked anything before. I hadn't heard of wool washes. I didn't really know, um, you know, anything about, you know, the care of wool garments. Um, so I was looking to knitters who knew more, who appeared to know more than I did or who I perceived to know more than I did because of other things that they had said that I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a valid um, piece of information that works, that's really helpful. And that piece of information was, uh, woolite is the worst thing you could ever use to, to wash your wool garments. And I was like, oh, really? Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> and the reason that was given was that well, when it was first created back in the 50s, it was gentle compared to, you know, lye and bleach and other things that people had available to them. But now um, it's, it's, we, now um, there's things that are so much better that you can use to wash your wool garments with. And so then I found out about these no rinse wool washes. You know, I, I never questioned that statement. I just accepted that as fact. And uh, and I began using no rinse wool washes and it wasn't until I wanted to over dye um, this Air, old Aaron sweater like 10 years ago that and the wool washes you know weren't getting this uh, sweater that was dirty I was dying it because I had stains on it it wasn't and I thought well, I have nothing to lose I'm going to put a little bit of Tide uh, and some borax in the water if it dissolves the sweater oh well um, and it got it clean not only did it get it clean, oh, there was a huge amount of dirt on the bottom of the sink. And that was an old sweater. It had been worn a lot outdoors, raking leaves, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so it had accumulated a lot of dirt over time. And it got clean in a way, and because it was a truly dirty sweater. It wasn't, it wasn't just me, oh, doing my annual, I'll oh, get the dust off of the sweater that I've worn over t-shirts all winter long uh, and I just want to block it to refresh it and get it into shape and make it smell nice type of washing. It was like this thing was dirty. And so I started thinking about this recently when I w went, went to over dye the sweater a second time. I started to question um, the advice that, that we as knitters hand to each other about what the correct thing is to wash our woolen garments with. And I really wondered, first of all, if it was true about woolite, I could find no evidence for it. In fact, I found one article that said uh, there's no information anywhere about what the formula for woolite was in the 50s. And based on what the pH level that it is now, it's very similar to, to other uh, wool washes that, you, that are marketed specifically for, for wool. And, and then I started really looking into, well, what is safe to wash wool with and, and what are people recommending? And, you know, one of the things people say, oh, I use shampoo and, and um, oh, you, you're going to use shampoo. You should use baby shampoo because that's, that's gentler. So I started looking into baby shampoos. And the, the reason baby shampoos are gentle is because they use a different set of, um, I, I don't know if it's surfactants. They use different ones um, than are used in shampoos that adults use. And the reason they use different ones is because the ones adults use sting your eyes and the ones that baby, the ones for babies doesn't sting your eyes. Um, and that, that's the goal in a baby shampoo is, is to have it not sting the baby's eyes. Um, but the disadvantage is it doesn't clean the hair as well. I mean, that's why they put the one that stings <laughs> into adult shampoo is because it does a better job cleaning your hair. So I think, you know, anytime we, we hear some information about this is better or this is why, I think it's always good to question it and ask for some evidence. And, you know, that's another thing I, I'm planning on doing in the next few months is see if I can find a chemist. <laughs> Who can really explain what it is that that wool can tolerate and what it does best in? Because I wash my socks. Uh, I can I wear them a couple of days and then I throw them in the laundry and I wash them with my underwear and bras. Throw in a Tide pod, I, cold water, gentle cycle, and so they get washed way more than any sweater of mine ever gets washed. They take more wear because I'm walking on them a lot of times without shoes around the house and they are just fine. So I, you know, I don't question that it makes sense to take care of your, your 
um, wool garments. But I do question some of the statements that we take as fact from people without any evidence. So another example of sort of this collective knitting intelligence is the huge range of, of options that we have uh, in, say, knitting a sweater. The, the construction options that we have. We can knit top down, we can knit bottom up, we can knit seamlessly, we can knit um, flat and, and seam. We can knit uh, any kind of, of armhole and sleeve construction and neck. We have so many options. And we get these options from designers from all over the world and it's fantastic. But for some reason, one particular construction method will, will catch on and it will get labeled as better or um, easier or some other label that is really, it's not, that's not true. I, I've never really been quite sure what it is that causes uh, this, this collective belief that a particular uh, knitting construction is better. I mean, I understand liking one more than another, but but this this idea that say toe up socks is is somehow better than cuff down socks. I I've never understood that, and I would argue that the reasons people give are not valid for everybody. I remember when I was first hearing about toe up socks, people raving about them because you could try them on as you knit and like you can try on any sock as you knit. <laughs> that, that's, that's not an advantage of a toe up sock. Then there was also the idea that, oh, you can keep knitting until you run out of yarn. And I'm like, I always have, I knit my sock leg as long as I need it to be seven inches long and I always have 25 grams of sock yarn left at the end so I wouldn't want to knit my sock any longer than it is so that was an advantage for me I want to knit for my brother it's potentially an advantage uh, but I also like my socks to match I knit self-striping socks I want my socks to match so I have other techniques that I use when I'm getting cuffed down to help me gauge whether I'm going to have enough yarn or whether I need to, to employ a contrast color for the heels or the toes or something like that. So I think when people say, well, there's an advantage to this technique and here's what it is, they're, they're neglecting to say what the advantage is of the other technique and also to own up to what the disadvantages are of the, te of the technique that they're espousing. So exploring your choices, um, even if you enjoy a technique, you find a technique to be perfectly um, acceptable for you. When you hear about an alternative way, I think it's worth trying because you never know whether you're gonna like that technique even more than the one that you're currently using, or if you'll start to see, oh, well, I still like my, my technique that I've been using, but I can see how that one might be useful. Or maybe you don't immediately see when it might be useful, but sometime in the future, when you do run into trouble, using your standard technique, you'll remember, you know, I remember using that other technique and that might be useful for me now. So really what I'm saying is that you should continue to learn. I, I don't think you should ever accept that one method of doing something is the right, one true correct method. That there is always going to be situations in which uh, one technique might actually work better than another. Um, a technique that you typically really despise using might end up being very useful in a specific situation. So if you keep your mind open to other possibilities and try things out, even if you don't think you're going to like them, uh, you never know what you're going to end up really holding on to and thinking, oh, I really like this, and then what that will lead to and what that will lead to after that. And I, I try to keep that open mind when it comes to um, project types, project construction methods, um, trying different ones to see uh, whether I like this method in general or whether I would want to use it in specific circumstances. Consulting the collective knitting intelligence is a great thing that we have. It's wonderful that we have access to knitters all over the world who can offer us solutions to knitting problems 
that we don't know how to solve. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, one particular person's um, solution to your problem may not be the only possible solution and it may not apply to your specific set of circumstances. So keep your mind open, uh, constantly look for other paths to get you to the same end point, and then experiment yourself with what works for you. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. Thanks for watching.